Okay, well, good to be with you guys again, and uh, you know, the, the Word is always powerful, amen? There's power in the name of Jesus, and there's power in the Word of God. Um, let's bow in prayer before we uh, enter into our message today. Jesus, we thank you that your Word is truth. Lord, that you've spoken truth through the very scriptures that are, that are in the Bible. And, and Lord, you, you spoke to the Thessalonians through your servant Paul. And God, we're going into that scripture today, and as we go verse to verse in that passage uh, in First Thessalonians today, God, we just pray that you would open the eyes of our heart and help us to understand what your message is so that we can take it home with us, God, and, and that will change us. And uh, God, that we will uh, we'll glean much from the Word today, that you'd help me to explain it in the way that people can understand in the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So our text this morning, um, we're continuing in our series in the book of First Thessalonians. Our text this morning is found in First Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, from verses 13 to 20. And um, the title for my message this morning is Encouragement in the Face of Opposition. Encouragement in the Face of Opposition. So just to introduce the passage from where we left off last week, um, in this passage of Scripture, Paul lays out his heart for the Thessalonian church. And uh, considering how much Paul, Silas, and Timothy... Uh, had had trouble in Thessalonica. They'd been ushered out of the city uh, on, on their original visit, uh, and they didn't have much time to establish a church there. Considering that fact, um, we've already discussed how wonderful it was that when Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica, he brought back a great report because the church wasn't just barely hanging on by a thread. The, th the church was thriving. Um, they were doing really well. And thankfully, Timothy had this report, and, and Paul, being the, the, the one who was instrumental in planting this church, was just overjoyed at what he was seeing happening in the lives of the Thessalonian believers. So the apostle can, continues this morning uh, in, our, in, our, uh, in our text here to speak concerning the joy that's resident inside of him because of what was happening in the church, what God was doing inside of these people. So Paul continues in his letter in chapter 2, verse 13, and he says this. He says, And we also thank God continually, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God which is indeed at work in you who believe. So you can just, you know, when, when he's introducing that thought, you can just see his heart. He's filled with joy. He's so thankful to the Lord that these people have opened up to the gospel and, and the gospel has taken root and it's changing them. So the Apostle Paul and his ministry companions, um, they, 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 they were so overjoyed because their journey through Macedonia was very difficult. It was not an easy journey at all. And, and, and we saw in earlier uh, portions of 1 Thessalonians how, how God had actually spoken to them and asked them to come over to Macedonia to preach to these people whose hearts were prepared to hear the word. But it was hard. It was difficult. In Philippi, they got chased out of, out of town. They got... They got uh, you know, well, they actually they got thrown in jail and beat up, and then when they when they got out of jail, miraculously God took them uh, the, out of Philippi, and they went to Thessalonica. They they were asked by the magistrates to leave that city, and then they went to Thessal Thessalonica, and then people that were there that resisted them caused trouble for them, and the believers had to had to say, "Hey guys, you guys need to leave right now because it's getting really." really difficult, and, and you're in great danger. So they, they left Thessalonica under those terms. But um, yeah, they, these guys had a genuine encounter with, with, with Jesus, and it changed them. 
And, 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 and they were being obedient to the word that had been shared with them. And, and the Spirit of God was, was working in power in their midst. But for the Thessalonian believers, or the Thessalonian believers, I should say, things weren't easy for them neither. Um, just as Paul had, had been uh, given a poor reception while he was there, uh, they were under a great deal of, of uh, opposition. The church there was under a great deal of opposition for taking a stand in Jesus. So we can be thankful that um, churches like the church in uh, Thessalonica were established. You know, they're an example to us um, right here where we're at of how um, it doesn't matter necessarily what's happening on the outside around us. Things can be very terrible. We can be opposed. We can be persecuted. And yet, in the midst of that persecution, we can flourish. And, um, you know, Thank, we can be thankful to God. And I, and I tell you, as your pastor, uh, I'm thankful to God for you guys and what I see the Lord doing inside of your hearts. Uh, it, it's really wonderful to see how so many have come and have opened their hearts to the teachings of the Word. And, 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 and people are flourishing in their faith and, and, and they're obeying God uh, as, as they walk their daily lives out. And you know, many of you here, okay, uh, have come from different places, and, and um, you're not just responding to the call of a fallible preacher like me, right? I'm, I'm just a little guy, and uh, God's given me this, this wonderful responsibility to, to shepherd under the chief shepherd, this, this wonderful flock. I, but, but you guys aren't here um, because of a human teacher like myself. That's not, that's not why you're here. You, you're here because the Holy Spirit has done a work inside of you and has drawn you. And, and we work together in partnership. Yes, each of us has a different part to play. I do preach the word, and uh, I, I pray that I stay true to the word in its context and how you're supposed to understand it. That's my, my mission from the Lord. But you are here because the word of God is what it is. And the word of God is power, and it doesn't matter who wields it. It is the word that is power. It is the spirit that brings life to the word. The messenger is immaterial to that. So I understand this, and, and I'm thankful for you guys. And I'm thankful to be having uh, the, the position of being a pastor here because it's a beautiful blessing to walk alongside God and his wonderful work in you. And it gives me great joy to see what Christ is doing in so many of your lives. And, and it's in so encouraging. You know, before I was a pastor, I'd, I never understood quite the blessing that it is to be able to see people grow spiritually and get excited about serving Christ and to want to dig deep into the Word and to want to grow. It's beautiful. And, um, you know, it's because God's Word is at work within you. That's why. And, um, you know, in this day and age, there's numerous preachers and teachers teaching and preaching all over the internet. You can turn on your uh, computer and you can look at a thousand different sermons and some are powerful preachers and they're preaching the truth and there's good things coming, but there's some very dangerous things that are being said out there. Things where people's emotions are being stirred and their heartstrings are being tugged by, by uh, I guess you could say, a fleshly spirit. A spirit that is, that is not the spirit of Christ. And, and, and it can be very deceptive. It can appear to be the spirit of Christ, but it's not. And it's so, so important that with technology and the capacity to reach out there into the world and to listen to all the stuff that's coming your way, that we're very careful and we're very discerning as to how, what we accept. Because you can't just accept um, a, 
a word out there because it stirs you emotionally and gets you all worked up emotionally. You can't, yeah, you know, some people are gifted speakers. And, oh, man, you can engage with what they're saying. And, and before you know it, you're feeling excited about it because there's a lot of talent and ability that's there. But, my goodness, you know, it's so easy for us to swallow some things that aren't right. And we've got to be very careful. Um, you know, the Galatians, unlike the Thessalonians, had a real problem with this. You know, the, the Thessalonians they took the pure word of God that Paul was saying, and you heard what he said, you know, like, this isn't my words, this is God's word. And they took the word, and it flourished in them, and it grew in them. But there's other churches like the Galatians who had problems. They had listened to some words out there from some smooth, slick preaching that was going on and some teaching that was going on. It was, it was just, it was taking them off. It was taking them off into, into the wilderness away from the will of God. And, and Paul said in Galatians 1, 6 to 9, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a, a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, and now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Wow. Well, if you, if you listen to that scripture, and you, you look at it, okay? What's Paul saying? He's saying, even if we, he's talking about himself, or the apostles, any of those people, even if we or an angel from heaven should speak to you a different gospel than what had originally been preached, let them be under God's curse. Heavy words. The human spirit, you see, is subject to being deceived by impressionable emotion. Nobody is exempt from the danger of going astray. Nobody. Not even apostles. We've seen that with Peter as he as he started out in the right place, and Paul actually had to give Peter a rebuke because he started going back into something and bending to what his ear was hearing from, from these guys that were saying, you've got to be following the law of Moses to be saved. When, 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 er, and, and, and Paul was, was saying, you know, it's by grace through faith that you are saved, and this is not of yourselves that, that law brings conviction of sin, sure, but it's not going to save you. What saves you is grace, grace from Christ given you freely. So even Peter was being led astray and was beginning to shun the Gentiles and all this, right? So what Paul is saying here is that nobody is exempt from going astray, including apostles and angels. How are we to measure then, what we hear. How do we measure what we hear? When we turn on our, our, our computer, when we listen on the television, how are we to determine what is true? The answer to this question is this. We need to ask another question. What are the original teachings of the apostles? What did they bring directly as a message from Jesus Christ to his church. That's what we need to look at. The word of God has been given to us as a guideline, and we, we need to be very careful in following it, and not just picking and choosing what we want to hear from it, but following it in its proper context, taking all scripture into, into consideration. If we do this, if we do this, and we do not turn to the right or the left, when things come that are not right, we're going to know it, and we're going to turn away from it. We're not going to turn to the right or the left, and we're not going to get waylaid like the Galatians. We're going to be like the Thessalonian church who accepted the pure word of God as coming from the Lord. And they weren't looking at the preacher. They were looking at Jesus. See? They stayed true to the message of the pure gospel as God originally intended it, rather than being led astray by falsehood, by false teachings. Paul continues to encourage the Thessalonians for what has been taking place in their church. In verse 14, he says, For you, brothers and sisters, I like this, for you, brothers and sisters, became 
imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everything in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit, and the wrath of God has come upon them at last. I like this because the original church in Jerusalem, those people, during the time when uh, uh, Stephen, you guys remember the story about Stephen? Stephen and Acts? where uh, there was stones thrown at him till he died. You remember that? Well, right after that happened, a great persecution broke out against the church in, in Jerusalem. And those people were, were, were scattered. They, they, they hunted them down. They were throwing them in prison. And they scattered. But it didn't, it didn't dampen it. As a matter of fact, it was like taking sparks and throwing it into the forest where there was once a little campfire in the middle of Jerusalem, right? Now all of a sudden there's this giant forest fire burning all the way through the, the Roman Empire and into the ends of the earth. Well, do you suppose God understood that that needed to take place? Sometimes God needs to rattle our cages a little bit to get us to move. <laughs> Sometimes he does. Because he doesn't want us comfortable. God doesn't want us just to come to church to be comfortable. He wants us to come to church to glorify Him. And how do we glorify Him? By looking outside of the, the, the church to the ones that don't know Him. That's why things like what's going on, on on October 15th with Jack Jackson, those are important. And we need to be serious, asking God, show me who you would like me to invite to this. And, and maybe it's not about that. Maybe it's about you going um, out for coffee with your neighbor. And just saying, and talking to them about their life and sharing the gospel with them. See? Ah, well, the persecution anyways. One of the big reasons why the Gentile community in Thessalonica um, was, uh, was flourishing was because of this persecution. So, um, Paul is saying, you guys suffered from your own people the same things that the Jews suffered from. In, in Judea under the weight of the people that, that the same people with the same spirit that killed Jesus and that killed John the Baptist. The same spirit is on these other people that you're dealing with. And, um, you know, the church in Thessalonica was largely Gentile. So these guys are, are getting um, persecution from the Gentile community. Now, well, why would that happen? Well, I believe one of the big reasons why that was happening, and, and history tells us this, is that at that time, you know, most people were not agnostic or atheists or anything like that. They were very, very engaged in their religious activities. Most people had religions that they followed. And um, the Christians were monotheists. In other words, they believed that there was only one God. Well, the culture of that day... The pagan Gentiles in, in Thessalonica, they, they worshipped a myriad of deities. There was just a whole bunch of deities that they were worshipping. You know, they, they wouldn't have minded so much if the Christians could just keep their ideas that the God they were worshipping was just one of many gods. They, they, they wouldn't have minded that. They could accept that idea because there was all kinds of gods and they just accept another one into the, the mix. Yeah. Oh yeah, you, you worship the god Pan, I worship Zeus. You know, you worship Athena, I worship... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, you, your, your pathway is a pathway to your god and my pathway is a pathway to my god and this is how I feel. Uh, this is how I feel I should go and, and that's my truth and, and this is your truth and everyone has their own truth and everyone's all together and there's this, this environment where they uh, they don't mind if the, if the other guy thinks a little bit differently as long as they don't say that they're exclusive. But the claim, the Christians come and they are saved. And all of a sudden, the revelation is made to them that Jesus Christ is God and there is no other God besides Him. He is the one true God and all other gods 
are a fallacy. They're, they're false gods. And the Christians claiming that Jesus is the one true God. The idea to suggest that their way was the only way. How dare they? The idea to suggest that their idea of morality could only be true if it followed the Bible or the, the scriptures of, of, of Christianity. How dare they say that the morality that they have is confined to those places? After all, there are so many different ways of thinking. So many different people. And, and besides that, when the Christians started their church, people are, people are quitting their religions and it's, and it's may having an impact on the economy. They, the people that are making idols are losing money because they're losing employees and businesses are shutting down and it's just bad for the economy. And all the economy surrounding the temple worship and the sacrifices and selling of animals and all that stuff, that's all interrupted by these Christians because they say that this is not worshiping the one true God. How dare they? How dare they? As well, under the Roman tyranny, the Caesars were, were worshipped. They were worshipped. They were put in the pantheon as another god. And, and when you bowed your knee to Caesar and worshipped him, you were doing a good thing. And those Christians, of course, they're not going to bow their knee to Caesar. They're not going to worship Caesar. So how dare they? They're interrupting our society. They're, th they're, they're upsetting the apple cart, upsetting the balance of everything that we've come to be accustomed to. To refuse to bow to Caesar was disrespectful of his rule and authority and was viewed as treachery. So, the result of all of this, friends, was that there was great persecution against the church of Christ in this place. Persecution from the Gentiles. Paul and Silas and Timothy had problems from the Jews. And these guys that were Gentiles that were saved had all kinds of problems from, from the Gentiles. No longer were they going to the feasts. They were broken apart from the traditions of their family. When it came to the festivals of worshiping their gods, they wouldn't participate anymore. Well, we backed off because we only worship Jesus. Oh, how dare they? How dare they run interruption on the way that we've been doing things? Hmm. Well, Paul, Silas, Timothy, they are preaching um, the same messages they've always preached, right? That Jesus is the only way to God and, and the Jews didn't like that much either. So if you were a Jew and you came to Christ, well, you are an enemy of, of, of Judaism too because, because now you're saying that the law of Moses is not the way to salvation anymore. Well, they're okay as long as you say that, yeah, you follow the law of Moses. Yeah, sure, have your little Christian thing on the side. But primarily, you must follow the law of Moses. That's how you enter the kingdom of God and that's how you're made right with God. And these guys are preaching a new gospel that the law... Is not, is not the way that you're saved. It's through faith, by the grace of God. The law was established to show us truth and what God is like and all these things. But that's not where salvation comes from. And then the, the, the Paul and Silas and Timothy are preaching us. And these Jews that were, were wanting to, to see the, the law of Moses preserved... Um, were furious with Paul, furious with Silas, furious with Timothy. They wanted them cleaned off the face of the earth. Sounds awful familiar, doesn't it? Sounds awful familiar. Paul, for instance, right? What was he before he was saved? He was a persecutor. Paul was a chief persecutor, as a matter of fact. Until Jesus got a hold of him, he gave approval to the death of Christians and to the imprisonment of Christians. He was there when the stones were crashing in on, on, uh, on Stephen's skull. And he was giving approval to it all. Wow. Okay. 
But in that case, we see, si- we, see, uh, we see Stephen. What did he do? When the stones are crashing in on his skull, how did he respond to that persecution that was coming against him? Did he gnash his teeth at the people and say, how dare you, just like they were doing on the other side to, that, to the Christians? How dare you defy God? How dare you persecute his anointed ones? His no, that's not, That wasn't what Stephen was doing. Stephen looked out over those people and he was like Jesus. Jesus who said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do when they, were po- when they, when they had pounded nails through his wrists and had, and had, had pounded a crown of thorns over his head and had beat him so badly they could hardly recognize the Lord. He looked out at the people who are lost as sheep without a shepherd, saying, Father, forgive them for they not know not what they do. And then you have Stephen in the early church looking out at the people who are throwing rocks that are crashing into his skull and killing him. And he looks up and he says, do not hold this sin against them, Lord. Do not hold this sin against them. So this is the Thessalonians. They were responding in a Christ-like manner. In a manner that Paul had learned was the right manner of responding. And the word here reminds me of Romans 12, 17 to 21, where Paul instructs the Roman church how to respond to their enemies in light of the persecution coming against them. In this passage, Paul writes, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Anyone. This is a message to the church throughout the ages. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, This is the template, friends, that was set in the place where persecution was fierce, was really fierce. We got fierce persecution going on all over the world here and and in Canada. We don't really have that kind of persecution going on. Thank you, Jesus. There's not someone coming here into church this morning and grabbing me and throwing me in handcuffs and dragging me off to jail. In some countries, that happens. And we have very little persecution in in compared to the Thessalonians. Nevertheless, my friends, the human spirit apart from God remains the same regardless of what place on the planet you're living in or what age you're living in. Human nature is the same across the board. The same disdain for uncompromising Christians is present in Canada. The same as it was in the Jewish and Thessalonian society of the first century. The same angry questions are being asked here as they were being asked there. How can we say that our idea of morality is right? And that other people's different ideas about acceptable morality are wrong. How can we say that? How dare you? The same thing is being said. See, nobody minds if we in Canada here are accepting of others' ideas of right and wrong as being on par with ours. If we tell people that our truth is our truth and their truth is their truth and that they are okay with us as long as they keep to themselves and do their thing, they can follow their truth, we can follow our truth. If we were to say that to them, oh yeah, you're an acceptable part of our society, just as the Thessalonians, if they would have said, oh yeah, you can worship Athena, you can worship Zeus, just like they were doing. You know? Well, yeah, yeah, go ahead and worship Zeus if you want, but I think Athena's better. You know, like, If that was the way that Christians responded in society, there wouldn't be persecution. 
There wouldn't be any persecution. However, as soon as we begin to tell people that Jesus is the only way to God and everlasting life, then they begin to take offense with our message. It's not just... Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, about the root of this, but... They're asking the question, the same as those guys. Is not our truth just as relevant as their truth? They get angry when we say Jesus is the only way. How can evangelical Christians be so intolerant of other ideologies and ways of living? What about other religions? What about Islam? What about Hinduism? What about Buddhism or the various localized religions of the First Nations of this continent? What about the Aztecs or the Mayans? Or, or how about, if your roots are in Europe, how about Scandinavian deities or Asian deities of many people's past heritages? Or the Druids? Are these not equally relevant pathways to God? How can you say that your Jesus is the only way? You're so narrow. You're so bigoted. In our pluralistic society, tolerance is expected, even demanded. And the concept of freedom of religion, which permits all religions, is sometimes misinterpreted to mean that all religions are somehow equally true. Well, this is just where we're living, isn't it? We're living in that time. The spirit is the same here today as it was back in the first century. But from our perspective as believers in Jesus, we hold firmly to our belief that the Christian gospel is the only correct path to God and the only way to everlasting life. While at the same time, we allow for people to reject our message. See, faith requires that people have a liberty to believe and also the liberty not to believe. Although we affirm the right for people to believe as they decide, it does not mean that we think that all faiths are true paths to God. Allowing other people to believe as they wish does not mean that we quit believing that there is only one way to God and that that way is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to stay true to that message. How we present that message is all important, though. How we respond to the persecuting crowd is equally as important today as it was in the first century. We believe that Jesus is the one true Lord over creation. Jesus claimed to be the one true path to the, Lord, to the Lord God. He claimed to be God in the flesh. And the historical records of his life and ministry back up his claims. The apostles believed what they saw, what they heard from the Lord. They believed it so much that they all died they rather die than to reject the truth that they had come to know. Even John, the Apostle John, who was the only apostle that didn't give his life up for the sake of the gospel, right? And by, by meaning give his life up for the sake of the gospel, these guys were being told, recant your faith in Jesus Christ or die. And they were like, we would rather die a thousand deaths than recant what Jesus has done in us because it's the truth people it's the truth jesus is the living god who came down to save mankind from their sins and he loves you and despite what you do to me despite if you cut off my arms if you crucify me upside down if you put me to the flame if you take off my head i will not deny the lord that bought me because he is the everlasting god and forever he shall reign and his truth shall reign forever. And there's nothing on heaven and earth that could separate me from his love. So do whatever you will. But know this, that the Lord God loves you. And you can be changed by his mercy and his grace if you come to him. That was the message of the apostles, even as they were dying. John refused to recant his faith in Christ. And he was dipped in hot oil. The John that wrote Revelation... <laughs> The Lord permitted him to live out his life, but he suffered. Oh, he suffered. Can you imagine being dipped in oil? He said, if you stop and recant your faith in Jesus Christ right now, this torture will stop. No. I will not recant. 
See, like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John stated with clarity that Jesus is the only way to God. It's written in 1 John 5, 11, and 12. And this is the testimony, the testimony. I like how that, that's put. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. This is the truth. Our pluralistic society will not accept that truth. You stand for Christ and stand on that truth that we just read right there. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to be persecuted just like the Thessalonians were. But how do we, how do we respond to this? How did the Thessalonians respond to it? How did the early church respond to it? Do we fight back? Do we take vengeance out of God's hand and put it in our own hand? Or do we look to another example? Do we look to the example of Jesus and his apostles? Remember, the teaching of Jesus and the apostles that was originally given. That is the word of God. And that is applicable in every generation, in every society, in every every circumstance and it doesn't matter how bad or how different the persecution is around us Jesus set the example first of all do we take vengeance ourselves no Isaiah predicted what the Lord would do he's God the creator of the whole universe and yet in Isaiah 53 7 he was oppressed and afflicted yet he did not open his mouth He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Is that how we respond to persecution? I pray it is. This is what God did in the face of persecution against him and his system of values as an example for his children to follow. Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, and this is God's word, not mine, In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek as well. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asked you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's the words of Christ. It's counterintuitive to the flesh and everything we learn about defending ourselves and standing up for what is right. It's counterintuitive, I know, but there's a, a wisdom behind this that is beyond the flesh, that is beyond human comprehension. When we obey the Lord in His teachings, there's something that happens. People's hearts are touched because the Spirit of God touches them and pierces deep inside of them and they're really asking the question, what is with these people? If I were in their shoes, I'd be, "Mm." I wouldn't take that garbage from them, that crap from them. I wouldn't take, oh, I'd let them have it. If I don't let them have it physically, I'd let them have it verbally. Anger, anger, response, hatred. Oh, you, how dare you defy God? This is the word of Christ. Love your neighbor and also love your enemies. Love them. What is love? What is the definition of love? Look at 1 Corinthians 13. That's the definition of agape love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. Does not boast. Is not proud. This is love. This is the love of God. And he wants us to have this for our persecutors, for our enemies, of the society that, that is so anti-Christ. God is going to take vengeance on all of this. He, he will make sure everything is straightened out. We don't have to take vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Our responsibility is to pray for those that persecute us, to bow our knee before our God and say, Lord, have mercy on them. Do not hold this sin against them, O God. 
Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Do you understand? Out there in the world, these people that don't know Jesus don't know their right hand from their left. They're blind. So how can you hold them accountable for something they can't even see? We can't. Only the God of the universe can break through to them and show them the light of the truth, just like he did with Paul the Apostle on the road to Damascus. That is the only way that things are going to change. We're not going to establish some Christian utopia by forcing our way and by jumping up and down and smacking our opponents. It's not going to happen. And the Christianity that's doing that is going against the Word of God. And it needs to stop. And it needs to stop now. Because if we have a hope of reaching this generation for Christ, it's not going to be because we raise our angry voices at our opponents. It's going to be when we love them and care for them the way that Jesus cared for the broken and the downtrodden and those who were deceived by the devil that needed release. Jesus Christ came into this world to save, to deliver, and to heal. That is the gospel. And there is no power on earth that is its equal. The Lord God has given us life. And he says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. So folks, when you turn on your TV, when you open your computer and you start to listen to those preachers, you measure what those preachers are saying against what is written here by Jesus. And if it's not in line with it, you need to push away. I know these are very stern words. But that has got to stop. We have very little time. There's thousands of souls out here in our community that don't know Jesus. And God is calling us, Hillside Community Church and other churches that are Bible-believing, stand for the gospel and shine your light. How can we help? How can we be Christ's hand in the midst of this calamity that's going on around us? Do we have corrupt politicians? Yeah, we do. So corrupt. Are they persecuting us? Yeah, they are. They are and they will. They'll continue to because they have the spirit of Antichrist that they're operating under. And as the day approaches, the spirit of Antichrist is going to get more and more powerful. And how do we respond to that? Do not overcome evil with evil, friends. Overcome evil with good. By being the lamb instead of you know, being a gentle lamb, instead of a voice looking for a podium. They're not going to turn from our word. The only word that's going to change them is the word of God. Saul of Tarsus, the apostle who used to be the persecutor of Saul. Now, he says this. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 111, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's what he says. Brothers and sisters, you see, Paul, Timothy, Silas, they faced the same sour attitudes and activities around them from their Jewish oppressors as we do here from our woke people and whatever else that's out there. It's the same spirit. The Gentiles that were, were uh, polytheists and were angry at the Thessalonian believers because they were interrupting their lifestyle, it's the same spirit. We need to get this right. Brothers and sisters, Paul says in verse 17, when we were orphaned by being separated you from a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. Paul says this, and then he gives the reason, he, he gives a reason for the persecution that's going on in the next sentence. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, and again and again, but Satan blocked our way. You see, there is a battle that's raging out there. And, and folks, your battle is not against the people. As much as we hate the woke agenda and we disagree with it and we think that it's horrible, your battle's not against Justin Trudeau or any of the other people that are the flagship people for these things. 
that's not where your battle is. Your battle is a lot deeper, on a deeper level. That's just the talking head. That's just the face of what's going on in behind the scenes. Ephesians chapter 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In Canada, when we face persecution by believing the exclusive message that Jesus Christ is the only Savior, and we take the Bible in its narrow view of morality for truth, and we get persecuted for it, we must never forget who we are fighting against. Never forget who you're fighting against. We're not fighting against the liberal government or woke agendas. We're fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. And how do we combat that? Well, the Lord says many things about how we combat that. Therefore, brethren, as it's written in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, for we live in the world, for though we live in the world, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and pretensions that set itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Wow, that's it. This is our battle plan. And God has given us spiritual armor. You are equipped as his children to fight the good fight of faith. The armor is at your disposal. It's there. And God wants you to be clothed in it. Be clothed in the armor of light. We call on God. How do we fight our enemy? We fight him on our knees. We call on God to fight on our behalf. And we leave the vengeance to him. We bow our knees, pray for him to fight our spiritual adversaries in behind the scenes, in unseen battles that none of us can see. Because we're not wrestling against the perpetrators of the wickedness that we see encroaching on us. It's principalities and powers of darkness in high places that we're fighting against. Therefore, our weapons cannot be here. Our weapons need to be here on our knees, calling out on the Lord, deliver us from our enemy, O God. And our God who sees us, sees us when we suffer for the truth, and he will make amends in the end, and we don't have to worry about that. He will take care of it. Assuredly, he will. Bless and do not curse. Bless, love your enemies. Be good to them despite the evil things that they might do to you. Is there any evil things happening against churches and Christians these days? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just become aware of a brother of mine that's been falsely accused of being uh, basically a hating, horrible bigot, and it's made its way into mainstream. <sighs> and quite the opposite is, is true. He's a loving, caring person who, who loves God deeply and who's just stood up for the truth, but he's become this target. He's become a target. Why? Because the enemy, <laughs> the enemy kept Paul or blocked, blocked Paul's way here. He says, Satan blocked my way. This is true. There, there is a struggle going on, and it's not always easy. You might lose your head over your faith. You know that? Maybe not now. You look at the way things are going with everything that's happening. 10, 20 years from now, if the Lord tarries, you may be losing your head for your faith. How are we going to respond to that? Do we look at that as a gift from God and a blessing from Him? The early Christians counted it a blessing to suffer for Christ. In our comfortable little middle-class lives in North America, we look at any kind of suffering as the worst thing for us. 
Well, some of the greatest lessons that you have learned in your life and that I have learned in my life has been when we've been hit hard. Because when we get hit hard, we got nowhere to look except up. We get marginalized, we get taken wrongly, we get <laughs> persecuted. All we can do is look up and say, Jesus, help me. Hmm. Bowing our knees, praying to God to fight our spiritual adversaries on our, our behalf, and being ready in the power of the Spirit to give an answer to our human adversaries to show them the reason for our hope. Yeah. Jesus said, love them. Bless, do not curse. Be good to them despite the evil things they're doing to you. In Matthew 16, 24 and 25, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What is a cross? It's a place to die on. That's what it is. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You're winning. No matter what. You're winning because Christ is on your side. And even if 10 years from now, Pastor Clint goes to the guillotine, I've won. My race is complete. I've won. It doesn't matter. They can take away my body, but they can't take away my life because my life is in you, Lord. And so is yours. In 2 Timothy 2, 3-4, to four, Paul said this. He said, Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. I looked at that and I'm like, wow, that's powerful. Unless you've been part of a military kind of structure, it's hard to get this one. But if you have any military background or anything like that, you understand When you become part of an army, you resign your own interests and set them aside for the interests of your commanding officers. And they might tell you to go here or go there or do this or do that, and it might not be what you want. But you go, yes, sir. Why? Because there's a plan. And for the plan to work, everyone's got to be working together. So Paul says, Act out in your suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What does the commanding officer tell us? Our commander in chief is Jesus. Jesus, what do you tell us? Love my enemies? Yes, sir. I don't really want to do that. <laughs> but yes, sir, I will obey. That's what that meaning. Don't en entangle yourselves in civilian affairs. The civilians are going to do what they're going to do. They're going to play many wars in their mind and in their conversations over tea. They're going to discuss the battle plans and everything like that. But they're not on the front line. And, and th th they don't understand that if they, if they did that in a military structure, they would be destroyed. You have to listen to your commanding officers. You have to follow orders. It's part of the example that God's giving us here. Don't involve yourselves with civilian pursuits since his aim since our aim ought to be to please the one who enlisted him, who enlisted us. Who enlisted you? Not Pastor Clint. Not the pastor who prayed the sinner's prayer with you when you were 10. No, you, you were enlisted by the living God, by Jesus Christ and the Spirit of Christ. He enlisted you and said, you are mine. That's who enlisted you. What does he say? So after Paul encourages the Thessalonian believers to stand firm in the midst of their opposition as their spiritual father, he feels like their spiritual father because the church was planted there with him. So he was really, he took it very closely, what was happening there. He says, this is how I feel about you guys. We're dispensers of the hope of Christ. <laughs> For what is our hope? Our joy the crown which we give glory in the presence of Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? 
indeed, you are our glory and joy. There's no meism there, is it? It's all to the glory of God, and he's so happy that the other believers around him are experiencing freedom, and they have the hope, and they have been bought with a price. They have been purchased. They are the possession of God. Oh, glory to God. That doesn't excite us. It should. It ought to excite us. The brothers and sisters sitting around you are God's possession, and you're, you're co-heirs with them in Christ. Why? Because Jesus has paid it all. He's given you life. He's given you purpose. He's given you joy. Ah, and he's in glory at the right hand of the Father, and one day we're going to go be with him forever. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We will all be with the Lord, those of us who are his. All of us. So let's get to the work of loving one another right now and shining the light out there for the darkness to see. Amen? God bless. Um, I'm going to ask uh, the team to come forward for the worship. and We're just going to uh, close in prayer and just close in a song. I think it's appropriate for us to sing, Great Are You, Lord, because He is greater than our enemy. Let's bow in prayer. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise. We thank you for taking care of us. Lord, help us. God, all of us need your assistance. We get easily angered, easily led astray in our flesh. So we acknowledge that before you, God. And, and for the things that each of us have that maybe we need to change, Lord God, forgive us. And steer us in the right directions, God. Help us, Lord, in our faith to grow stronger in trusting you. Help us, Lord, to shine brightly like st stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to those around us. And we pray for souls. God, we pray that this church would be filled with people that come to know you and that are new disciples in you. Prepare our hearts for the harvest, Lord, and, and help us, Lord, to be effective and productive in our knowledge of you out there in the streets. Give us patience. Give us endurance. Help us to bear up under suffering and to love our enemies, even as you have loved us when we were your enemy. And we praise you, Lord. Great are you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us as we close in that song?